welcome to Memphis Light, Gas, and Waters, Power Up Memphis. I'm your host, Gail Jones Carson, the Vice President of Community and External Affairs. The aim of Power Up Memphis is to take you, our customers, on an inside tour of Memphis Light, Gas, and Water to share our programs and operations with you, our customers. And by doing so, we can all better understand how we function as your utility provider. Today, my guests are Chris Harrison, who is a safety and training specialist in our electric division. Thank you so very much, Chris, for sharing uh, your time with us today. And Cliff D. Berry, who is the Vice President of Design, Construction, and Delivery. Uh, our topic today basically is going to be addressing outages uh, and our restoration efforts and also our mutual aid agreements. When we have major outages in Memphis and Shelby County, many times we have to call out-of-town crews to come help us restore energy quickly and safely for our customers. And as those companies come help us, Memphis like Gas and Water employees go and help those um, uh, companies who are tied to us with our mutual aid agreement. And Chris has been an expert, basically, <laughs> in going to other places to help them restore uh, their power. So, Chris, can you discuss with us how that basically works? You know, and tell us about some of the cities you've gone to, some of the experiences that you've had, and the great appreciation that you know, other cities uh, have uh, for light gas and water when we go help them restore power. Yeah, I've been on two of them. I went in 07 to Springfield, Missouri for an ice storm. But the most recent one was in, we went to Tallahassee. They called first, and uh, they're part of the APPA program, American P Public Power Post Association. Uh, so we went there. We were there for about five days, and so they, they got hit pretty good, but we weren't really, we was, they got hit, but we weren't prepared for what was going to happen next. So after we... So was that the hurricane? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, so it hits Tallahassee. We go down there. Our first night there, we had to slay in our trucks because there were just no hotel rooms. Uh, the trip <laughs> down there is tough because as you get further into Florida, the first south you go, there's no gas in Florida. So everybody starts going north to get their gas, and then you've got a convoy. You've got 13 pieces of equipment coming south that need diesel. So it's kind of hard. That that was a real obstacle to cover over there. So so, so you all you all had diesel. You all had to get diesel. So you had to find places that had diesel. Mm -hmm. We brought a field truck with us, a mechanic's truck, but he can only hold 100 gallons. So in a, a crane oh, truck. Oh, so you take some with you. Okay. That's for emergencies only. Because um, each truck burns a different amount of gas, so you can't really stay fluent like that. Like your one truck will burn so much, but certain trucks burn a lot more. So you're always having to. It's a logistics. We send one man ahead, and he does scouts for gas stations that we can go to, and then he's way ahead of us, and he's calling back, so we already know where we're going. So we sent 13 trucks. How many crews? Uh, it was six trucks plus four, ten trucks, and then three more pieces of equipment that we had to pull behind. Uh, two total crews, uh, two general foremen, one safety person, a mechanic. Okay, so were the others like linemen, troubleshooters? Yes, uh, crew leader linemen, you have... You have linemen, be five men on each truck. You have a crew leader and four linemen per truck. Okay. So when you all got there in Tallahassee, what kind of work mostly did you do? I mean, was it, were trees down? Were lines Everywhere. down? We started, uh, what you do, they give, they call it, assign you a bird dog. And a bird dog is a term used in the industry, so he gives you the work. And mm -hmm. he'll come with you, give you addresses, and from there you're on your own. You have to use your own training mm -hmm. and expertise in the field to, you know, ground it, isolate it, test it put it up and you you know make sure everything's done so usually you do circuit work first and that's what we were doing when they get out of town just like MLG and W does we build the backbone first and that's what they're gonna put you on circuit work you're not gonna do the small stuff yet um, so circuit is big and how many customers usually are on a circuit it varies cliff from oh it could be up to a thousand people on the circuit and here I don't know about <coughs> where we were in Tallahassee but yeah that's that's where all your taps come off of. You have to build the, the main thing first before you get everybody the small people lines on. But after that, we went to Sneeds, and that was a total change of everything. I've never seen that much destruction before in my life. We oh, went really? back west. Uh -huh. We started in Tallahassee, then traveled back west and got put into a co-op. It's called a staging area, Tent City. And there's buckets and trucks and everything as far as you could see were lined up. They have tents for food, sleeping tents, sleeping trailers. 
um, everything. They cater food for breakfast, dinner every night. They give you box lunches, but the amount of destruction was unreal. Just fields and fields of trees mowed down. It sustained 125 miles per hour winds for an hour and 15 minutes in this place. Wow. Um, you know, they had a, a complete loss. 100% of their customers were out after the hurricane. So and they put us on three phase circuits. Uh, they had a lot of utilities in there working and it was, we were there for two weeks straight in a little town called Two Egg, mm -hmm. Florida. So let me ask you this, I'm just curious, what does it take, how do you rebuild a circuit? You start from the beginning. I mean, just um, this is where, uh, out of the substation, starts coming out of the substation. First pull out is your first job. You isolate it, test it, ground it, make sure everything's safe. You ride it out more than once. You do everything. Then you start getting your material, and they start shipping poles in. And your, your own material, you don't, we don't bring material to them. They bring it to us, and you start setting them, putting up wires, rebuilding it. They'll give you some but, specs for their frame. But when they have that much destruction, where do they get the materials from to for you all to do the work? They're coming in by the truckload. There's companies waiting for it. Then they reach out. People are going to bring them in. I mean, they were dropping poles off and transformers. And whatever you could reuse, they want you to reuse. I mean, it's if you could reuse something, please do. That's what they're, you know, we didn't. Well, you talk, th this sounds like some major damage that you described. In Memphis, we've had some major outages, but none to that extent, right? Well, during the ice storm, we had some major damage. And that was in the <clears> 90s. That was, right, 94. And how, how long were our customers out when we had the ice storm? Is that the, was that what they call the Elvis Presley storm? Hurricane, Hurricane, Hurricane Elvis. Hurricane Elvis. Hurricane yeah, right. Elvis. We had people out probably, what, up to three weeks? It was, uh, uh, it was a long 19 one. or 20 days. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if we had that same level of storm today that we had back then, would our restoration efforts be quicker than they were back then. It would be. We've improved a lot since those days. Um, we've got it down to a science. We know exactly how many crews to call in for a proper restoration effort. And so I think we would. There's no doubt. Um, we would call in different people from different utilities. If we needed three crews from different utilities, we'd call them in. It would be based on the damage that we assess. And so you send out troubleshooters first. Correct. And the troubleshooters assess the damage. Correct. And then they let management staff know what's needed or who's needed. That would be correct. And then we would... Um, Is that when you determine whether or not we need to call in outside crews from outside of Shelby County? Yeah, if we look at it and see that we've got all this massive damage and destruction and it's more than what we can handle internally, mm -hmm. um, then that's when we'll decide that we want to get a mutual aid agreement and have some neighboring utilities come in and help so we can get the lights back on a lot quicker. Well, have we ever had a problem with outside crews coming to our aid when we when we have a lot of damage and we need outside help? I think the only time we would have any problems would be if they had damage as well. You know, if we had damage here in Memphis and Little Rock had it and Mississippi had it and that sort but of thing. But we've had crews come in as far as what, Kentucky and mm -hmm. far away. That's right? correct. That's correct. An example was in Sneed's uh, tree trimmers. We didn't have any. Uh, no normally tree. during a storm restoration, you have tree trimmers clearing rightways for us. We were having to do it ourselves because Asplen and all the local other tree trimmers that were huge were in Panama City, Mexico, uh, Mexico Beach. They didn't have enough people to send to Sneeds. And we've gone as far as New York. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. That's right. So, but a lot. So they had a lot of tree damage there, right? Yeah, I mean that's what. Yeah, it, it takes out everything, poles, trees, every you name it. So when the tree and I, and I say that all the time, customers get tired of me saying it. But when trees or limbs fall into those lines, customers they're gonna lose power. <laughs> they're gonna lose power. Yeah. And in Memphis, we have a lot of trees. We love our trees. They're beautiful trees. But if we have a major windstorm or rainstorm or ice, it's gonna fall into our lines. We're gonna have power outages. So Cliff, how do we? If we have a major storm and we have a lot of customers out, how is it determined whose services will be restored first? Well, we're going to start with the critical infrastructure first. That would be our substations, you know, if we have any pumping stations out, things like that. And that's so we'll be able to continue to provide that's service. That's correct. Any major MLGW infrastructure. Then we'll move to the hospitals. We'll try to get the hospitals back on first. 
And then we'll look at any pockets where we can get the biggest bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. If we can get 10,000 people back on mm -hmm. doing this work first, we'll do that. Probably. Well, what, would, what would serve? Would, would that be circuits? That would correct. That's you heard Chris. Chris alluded to the circuits, but that would be circuit work. Mm -hmm. Like he said, we try to we do the backbone first, mm -hmm. but we want to get on as many customers at one time. So we'll concentrate on that first. Meanwhile, you have to remember that during a situation like this, we do have people all over the place. Uh -huh. But we'll try to get the most people back on the quickest. And the little pockets that you mentioned, like the back property lines where trees are snapped in half, uh, where you get maybe four or five people back on with all this work, those will be the ones that will probably be last. And those are the customers who become the most frustrated because they tend to be out longer than the other customers. So, I mean... Um, what, what do we say to those customers other than be patient? Well, I think that's the purpose for bringing in enough people to do, you know, different work at the same time. So, you know, we can have some crews working on those pockets while other crews working on the big massive circuit work. So you try to have a lot of things going on at the same time. But, yeah, if we didn't have mutual aid agreements, then it would take a long time. But when you bring in other crews from across boundaries, then, yeah, they could work on those little small pockets while other crews are working on the major circuits. Well, one of the complaints that we get, Kristen Cliff, a, a great deal when we have outages, is that some of our customers believe that we turn on certain areas of town quicker than others just based on location and not based on what decision, whatever, what's best for the overall county where the outages are. So do we give preferential treatment to customers in East Memphis and uh, those areas? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, really, customers, some of our customers truly believe that. That's not true. Yeah, absolutely not. You know, like I said, if, if we can get 10,000 people or, you know, um, a large amount of people on first, it wouldn't matter if it was South Memphis, North Memphis, East Memphis, or what location it is, that's where we're going to start. Um, if we can get a thousand people on next after that, then we'll work on that. And like I said, really the last pocket's going to be, and, and it could be in East Memphis, you know, if it's a uh, back property line where there's four or five people on it, there'll be, there'll be less. That could happen in Germantown. That could happen anywhere. Okay. So we, we're going to have to wrap up because our segment is about to end. But I do want one um, piece of information for our customers. What do you all recommend regarding generators? customers having generators when they have power outages we saw this in Sneeds and here in Memphis we don't really have a big problem with it. I haven't seen it has happened back feed but turn your breakers off if you don't if you're just plugging in your refrigerator or something like that when you see us show up on the road if you see our trucks out and you've got a generator come talk to us just say hey I'll come find you. I was a troll man for 10 years so I would come find you and say look what do you got plugged into that thing usually there's plug in in, in the generator? Yeah. Okay. But then you've got some people that'll plug it into the main and they'll backfeed it through your house. So actually, so when they do have a generator, they should just plug in the critical. That's what they they need to do. And then uh -huh. some people will have backfed it. They've made, you know, kind of made some stuff and they can plug it into an outlet and they can backfeed their house, which can create backfeed on our line. And I, I would also know, say, know how to use a generator. You know, mm -hmm. don't use a generator under your garage, for example. You know, it has to be properly ventilated. Yeah, that can so, cause, um, yeah. There needs to be some training on maybe how to use or maybe read some literature on how to properly use a generator. Because it shouldn't be on in an enclosed environment. That's correct. Okay. And I understand why they do it. They, some people put it in their garage, they don't want to get stolen or something like that, they'll run it. And they think, and then they'll run something off of it and run it out of the bottom of the garage, but that still is not going to cut it. People have gotten... Okay. Well, we I greatly appreciate you all coming on and sharing this information with our viewers. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Cliff. Um, You're welcome. We greatly appreciate you. Welcome to Memphis Like Gas and Waters, Power Up Memphis. I'm Gail Jones Carson, your host, the Vice President of Community and External Affairs. Uh, we are going to be discussing how to safely heat your home during the winter months. And my guest today, his name is William O'Neill Williams, which stands for abbreviated as well. Wow. But I call him Will Will. I tease him, I call him Will Will. We're going to call him Will today. Okay, Will. Will is uh, the lead energy technician in our energy services department, 
And so, we are one of the things that some of our customers do, those who have um, a generator to heat their homes when we have outages. Could you please give us some safety tips regarding these generators, which they are wonderful uh, for providing our homes with electricity, but they also can be dangerous if not used properly. Exactly, exactly. And, and what I will start out with is generators should never be put in a conditioned, a conditioned space that's in the home. A generator should always be used outside. Uh, there's two things. It uses gasoline, mm -hmm. so the burnout from gasoline is CO, and CO, we all know, will, will, can kill you, basically yeah. can kill you. And, you know, using a generator, depending on the size of the generator that you purchase, it's not going to power your whole home. Mm -hmm. It's only going to power certain appliances in your, in your house. So, uh, such as? Such as maybe a refrigerator. You may do the television. Uh, it may do a freezer. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how many outlets that are attached to that particular generator. And usually it may not have a 220 device. It may just have something that the power is just a normal 110 uh, outlet in your home. So, so can you can you use too many outlets on it? Can you it, use? Well, generators are, are rated in wattages. So you may have a 5,000 mm -hmm. watt generator. You may have a 10,000 watt generator. So depending on what appliances you're going to use, you have to look at the wattage on those appliances to determine what size generator to use more appliances or less appliances. So customers need to know that don't do not try to heat your whole use everything uh, in your home for this generator. So what about the the heater the heat itself? Um, in regards, you, to you're it. talking about mm -hmm. like appliances and stuff. But if right. you want heat in your home, mm -hmm. that, uh, that generator will heat will you you know provide the electricity for your furnace for your to furnace. operate. Okay. You know, but you have to be mindful that it's not gonna. If you got a small 5,000 BTU generator, it's not gonna heat mm -hmm. your whole home. It'll it'll operate the generator, but you may not get a refrigerator on it. It may not operate a television. Okay. On average, if we're looking at you say it may not operate a TV. It's you you have to look at the wattage on it now. <laughs> now you you have to pick and choose the battles that you're gonna use this generator for. Okay. Now a space heater is 1,500 watts. So if you have a 5,000 watt generator, mm -hmm. you just cut into your your watch is you're going to have 3,500 watts left over. Now, you start to add in a television, uh -huh. a furnace, and, and other appliances, it diminishes the use of that generator. So you have to be mindful of what you're using it for. Okay. Uh, but one of the things that we really need to touch on and that I constantly hear when I'm talking to people about safety is not putting those generators in a garage because some people may not consider that a confined area like you discussed earlier. Right, right. As long as it can, it can be in a garage with the door open. With you the garage have, door open. Yes, yeah. you have to have that, that combustible air being able to, to breathe and let off of the, the burnout, the gas burnouts that are produced by it. But if you close it off and put it in a concealed space, that's a very dangerous situation you put yourself so in. So even though your, the door to your home is closed, if the garage door is closed, the fumes from the generator can seep into your home. They will seep into your home. Yes, that's correct. So okay. you, you never should use that generator close to your conditioned space. Get it away from your conditioned space. Okay, so let, let's move into something else that a lot of... Um, I don't know if younger people are doing this, but when I was growing up in that, we, and some of the older... Um, customers mm -hmm. uh, heat their homes with their ovens. Okay, then that's, to me, that's just as dangerous. Now, considering the burnout from gas, CO, uh, if it's contained in a conditioned space, it could be deadly. So we, we recommend totally never use your oven to, you know, to heat yourself. I understand, you know, your power gets out, not power, but basically if, if there's a problem with your heating Appliance, but so is that why know. they why people use the stove? It's because their furnace may not be furnace working. may not be working, uh, and then a lot of times space heaters. Space heaters are just as dangerous as is using uh, the stove, and oh, people really? don't. Yeah, they don't think so. You have to be mindful with using a space heater. A space heater has an electrical cord, mm -hmm. and and it gets hot. So the, the, cord? the, the cord, the insulation on the cord gets hot. And, and if you have a, a curtain or a, any type of combustible material, paper, mm -hmm. uh, cloth around that cord, that heats up. That's, most fires that occur from space heaters are from 
carelessness. You know, the worst thing we can do is plug a bunch of extension cords up because you see a lot. You go in some of the houses that are inspected by some of the guys, the team that I work with, what you'll find is they may have five space heaters going. But the, the truth is a, sta a space heater is a 1,500-watt item. Two space heaters on a, a, a normal 20-amp breaker is going to trip, so the safety is going to knock it out. So what so people they both, do... So neither one will work. Neither because, will work. Exactly. Okay. What people do is they'll put extension cords and run it to a, the other side of the house where it's on a separate circuit, the other side of this house where it's on a different circuit. So, so is that safer? That's not safe at That's all. not safe no, at all? No, okay. because remember, that cord will heat up. Electricity mm -hmm. traveling through that cord heats that cord up, and you may be laying on top of carpet. And that, when it gets hot, in any, any combustible paper. So how can they safely use a heater? Because a lot of people use space heaters. Space heaters are for, you, for heating a space. Oh, a space. Not a home. Not a home. Just a space. Just a space. If, if a bedroom. A, a bedroom, closed off, a small space. It's only for that space. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it must be attended to all the time. Oh. You can't. Turn a space heater on and then you're in another room. Well, one thing you can not supposed to put on high level stuff because yes, it could fall. It could fall over, right. But but attend to space heaters all the time. Never leave it unattended. Uh, they have some, some, some great things on the market. They have some, some tilt, fall safe space heaters that if it tilts over, it shuts off. But what if it doesn't? What, what, what if one day it, it doesn't, it doesn't shut operate off. like it's supposed to? But you still so, have to be concerned too about. The actually, even though it's a tilt safe or whatever, right. you still have to be concerned about how many you have plugged up. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you mean that if you, if you overload a circuit and if the safety doesn't kick in, and usually safeties are breakers or fuses, mm -hmm. you know, if that doesn't kick in, if you overload that circuit, that's a, that's a potential fire hazard. That's potentially could, could cause some major issues to, to the home. So we recommend you, you, if you got to use them, heat your space mm -hmm. and you know, attend them, keep it attended all the time. Well, does, say if somebody's furnace is not working well, does Memphis Light Gas and Water, uh, do we provide a service where we would check a furnace? Yes, I know we yes. do the, power, the uh, light up, pilot light up, pilot light up mm -hmm. program. Memphis Light Gas and Water has 11 technicians that are HERD certified. That's a, a residential energy certified. It's actually a, an international certification to where they go out and they assess things at the house and those, that recommendation puts them in a position where they provide that safety aspect, you know, it's a free service that the company offers. So customers can call in they and we don't, call. we do not charge them for we that assessment? We do not assessment. charge, no. We, we go so out. So we will assess their home, we will check for safety, we will check for yes. uh, ways that they can reduce their energy, energy consumption? Exactly, exactly. Bringing that energy consumption down. And, and, and reducing your energy consumption ultimately reduces your sure. utility costs. So customers do have control. control. Over, over their utility bill That's if correct. they get focused on energy conservation and just using some low cost, no cost That's items that will uh, reduce their energy consumption. That's, that is correct. And, you know, we always try to say maintenance first because if we can get people in the mindset of maintenance, we knew the winter was coming. Mm -hmm. Maintenance. You, if you change your filter, it operates like it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. You know, if you change your filter, it's, it's almost like being in a smoke filled room. If you allow a furnace, to operate and you don't change your filter, eventually something's going to go wrong. And then when you need it's that the same heat, for the air it's as well. the same thing. If you don't address that, so mm -hmm. maintenance, getting in the maintenance mindset to address annually, annually maintenance is your, maintenance your appliances. You just told me about that filter. I got to go home and change my filter out. <laughs> change so what, filter. What, what level, they come in grades, what's the best that they sh a customer well, should buy? Uh, it depends on if you if you have allergies, you mm -hmm. know you're gonna buy filters according to that. A filter can range anywhere from a dollar to forty dollars. So it just depends so on. So is the forty dollar really better? Or is that just no, the cost? Are you that's paying? just the cost. It's to, just that's the cost. Just so the what cost. what would we at Memphis I Gas and Water recommend to be safe for our customers? I, I would I would get a pleated filter. A pleated uh, filter. That's gonna trap. Write that down. A pleated filter that traps the the. the the debris in the air, because believe it or not, breathing air, we think it's a clean breathing air, but, but there's trash that floats around in there. I, w I would get a, a pleated filter, because I think that would be, uh, it's affordable, and it's, it's better than, than the lower grade filter. Okay, and how often should filters be changed? I base filter changing off of usage, but you know, there's publications that says every 30 days, mm -hmm. and if you get in the mindset of every 30 days, then you're, then, pretty, much then safe. you're, you're pretty much safe, yeah. but, but you know, there are filters out there that last six months. 
You know, so it like I said, depends on what you want to pay for. Okay, but I'm not going to go get a $40 when I know that. Nah. So we're nah. about to end this segment of the show, Will, and I appreciate you coming out. So please, number one, what number can our customers call if they need someone to come out from energy services just to inspect and assess their home? And also, what are a few tips that you want to leave with our customers? Okay, uh, the number that you can reach the energy services department is 528-4188. Uh, that, that number you can reach, you're always going to get a person. And, always going to get a person, you'll, you'll not a, a person, Not a recording, you'll get a person. Okay. Now, my thing with energy tips, there, there's some things that I, I would really recommend. If you're going to use a fireplace uh, and you have your heat going, turn your heat down. Turn the heat down. Turn the heat down. If the fireplace is off, make sure the damper's closed because if, it, if it's not, what occurs is the heat that you're producing in your house is going to get sucked up through your chimney. Oh, wow. So, so keep the damper closed. If there's glass front on it, make sure it's closed because you don't want your central unit to be, you know, being used through your, your, your fireplace and, your, and it's not in use. So in, in regards to space heaters, space heaters are for heating a space. Not a house. Not a house. Not a house. It, there, there's too many dangers that can occur. Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, I understand the seniors when, when if the, the unit is out, they, they slide that stove and they try to light those pallets to, to, to use that to heat the house up. Uh, gas burn off is a it's a moisture that's put into the air. And the, the bad thing is, you can sit and, and you think you're comfortable and you go to sleep and you, you won't wake run. up. Won't so wake. so if, if, as I, if, if at all possible, try not to use a, a stove as a heating appliance. Okay, now, well, I really appreciate it. We're having to wrap up now. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I do, I, I, I greatly appreciate you coming on and sharing Anytime. these tips. And yeah. we're going to have you back to continue this conversation because it's an uh, endless number of things that we can recommend to our customers so that they can be safe. And uh, well, let me, one last thing, customers, please. When it's cold outside, we recommend that you have your temperature at 68 degrees. Every degree above 68, your bill will go up 4 to 6 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have control over the total amount of your utility consumption, which affects your total cost. But thank you so very much for watching Power Up Memphis. And now... Here's a power moment to help you better understand how MLGW works to help you, our customer. Today's myth is when a major storm hits, that MLGW already pre-selects which area of town we will restore first. Well, the fact is, MLGW cannot predict the path Mother Nature takes during large intensity storms. But whatever areas are the hardest hit, or have the greatest concentration of outages in a given area, those are the places that MLGW will concentrate the majority of our resources towards initially. We will also work on other areas, but the hardest hit areas always take priority. For our customers who think we give priority to one area over another in Memphis and Shelby County, that's just not true. I'm Gail Jones Carson. Thank you for watching Power Up Memphis, and we'll see you next month. You're watching the Library Channel, a broadcast service of the Memphis Public Libraries and the City of Memphis.